How's it going, Paul? All right, how are you? Good, man. Nice to see you again, live and well. <laughs> I'm barely alive. <laughs> Dude, I have a, a ton of questions because I've been, since we last spoke, I have kind of caught up on all the content you've been posting. Obviously, your off-season progress, you got sick there for a little bit, yeah. um, but you kind of rebounded pretty well. And, man, I, I, I'm seriously impressed with where you're at right now. You are a monster, an absolute unit. Yeah, I had pneumonia. I had the flu, and then it turned into pneumonia. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a dumbass, and I never want to stay out of the gym. And I went back yeah. to the gym too soon, and just made myself sicker. So <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I, I coach people, and I tell them don't do that, and then I do it myself. Yeah, yeah. I, feel that I don't take my own. I don't take my own advice. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get my pro card next year, so I'm like, I I, I can't miss time. What happens once you – are you going to keep competing once you get your pro card? I feel like we talked about this, but – I don't know, man. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old, so, like, the reality of it is I, I'm not I'm not stepping on the Olympia stage unless they have a master's division, which they are – talking, which I, I think they are doing next year. Yeah. They're talking about putting a master's division in. So, mm -hmm. I, it's always been a lifelong dream to get a pro card, and honestly, if I just get one – <laughs> that, that's that's good enough for me but yeah i don't know yeah I, I i've said that at every level it's like i just want to win a show i just want to win my class and then you know now i'm competing nationally um now i want my pro card so right you, you know I, i'm sure i'll want to compete <laughs> if, if i get one right i was the same and, way I, I told myself i'd stop at i'm 25 now i said 26 is as long as i'll go and uh my show is in in four weeks from now and you know i'm like man I actually don't want to stop. Like, yeah, I'm, to I'm 48, going. man. Yeah. <laughs> I've said, every every show I've ever done, I've said this is my last one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> when you just get back on the horse. Well, it's like after prep, you're like, "Fuck this, I'm not doing right. it again." Right. And and then and then you right. know a few months goes by and your head gets straight again. And you're like, "All right, yeah." You, know. you start eating food, you get big. You're like, "All right, I can do this." Can yeah, I can, this. I can do I can do this again. And then every prep, I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> last one <laughs> although this year my prep this year was easy uh this was the easiest prep i've ever done i i, I just everything clicked uh the weight came off i really didn't have to starve myself uh do you, didn't do, did it, you do didn't do i know cardio justin's a proponent of high intensity interval training for cardio i think is, is that something mm -hmm. you guys did no <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, he, he gets mad at me when I tell people that, but I, I just like, dude, I'm not fucking doing that shit. I'm sorry. That's crazy, man. I could not. I've seen some of his clients, and I'm like, I don't know how you guys are doing that because that's. Yeah, he. Uh, we. I, I've got a long form interview. I'm. Actually, I was actually editing it before I jumped on here. That I'm gonna hopefully have up tomorrow or maybe Saturday with him, and we talk about it. And he's like, "Don't tell people that." <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> But, I, you know, I did on my last prep, I did it. But I, I feel like, uh, you know, so so here's the thing. He and I talked about it. I, You know, I I'm, I was 240 on stage, man, or r roughly 240. I mean, when you're carrying that much muscle, your metabolism is burning so hot hot anyway. You don't need, really need to do a bunch of stuff. And I think I've, I've transformed my body over the years. And, and what's changed now is because I'm carrying so much muscle, I, I've just my baseline metabolism so high. I mean, I, I right. get below 4,000 calories, I start losing weight. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I, I don't need to do the hit cardio at this point because I'm so damn big. And um, just walking it off work, works. But, you know, when you're 180 pounds or if you have a higher body fat going into the prep, then, then that's a different, different situation. For sure. Um, you know, so, I mean, I only lost 30 pounds through the whole prep, which, you know, considering my size is only, uh, you know, not, not that much of my body that's, weight, you know. I, yeah. You know, I went from 270 down to like 240. So, and a half that's water. So, you know, it's right. really, you know, I was probably like 12% body fat when I started. And I, I t checked out at the DEXA scan um, the day, uh, the, I don't know, two days before the show, I was at four and a half. Wow. That's great. I mean, I've lost and I pushed it pretty far in my off season. I got up to 255, 256, and I'm down to, I'm pretty close to like ready, I believe. Um, I just gotta get the glutes in shape, but I'm I'm down to two. I was two ten this morning, so okay, pretty big fucking drop. But I was a little dirty. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, you know, I how I tall are eating, you? So I'm six two, same height as you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're the same. Yeah, I'm just a half tad under six two. Yeah, yeah. And so we're, we're we're the same height. Yeah. 
so you're you're deep into the off season now. How has that been working? Are you having trouble with the food? I saw you made a, a video kind of talking about how you have some acid reflux going on right now. Yeah, I have. I I don't have a really big appetite to be honest with you. I never have. I was a skinny guy growing up. I mean, I I played basketball. Coming out of college, I was 170 pounds. So I, I have to fight to put on weight. Although I went through a fat period in my early 40s, uh, but I was kind of skinny fat. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was way less than what I do now, and I was, I was chubby. But, uh, I, yeah, I usually have to fight to put on weight, and, like, my appetite's not that big. I, I, have, to, I have to do uh, some tricky things to get the food in. Like, oh, like some, some it probably people don't want to hear this, but – I preach the opposite, but sometimes I have to do things like eat breakfast cereal and, yeah. and chew on, eat gummy bears and shit like that just to get right. the calories in. It's funny because so, one guy just asked, at 4K maintenance calories, what do you even do for vegetables? To me, that's easy. Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's easy to me, but what do you do? Nothing. I don't want to eat them. <laughs> 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 I mean, seriously, I just, I just can't, you know, and the, so here's what I do. I, I know it's not the healthiest thing. I use a I use a greens powder uh, yeah. to get it in, and then I take a fiber supplement. So I really have to to be able to get the food down because I'm probably eating around six thousand calories, uh, maybe higher on my high days. Uh, but to get the food down in the off season, I have to be very cautious with food volume. Like guys are like, "Why aren't you eating brown rice? Why aren't you eating vegetables?" Yeah. And I'm like, I just simply could not get the food down right. if I do that. So I stick with like white rice, cream of rice. Uh, things that are really easy to get down. Chick chicken um, is easy to get down. White fish is easy to get down. And then I'll use a greens powder to get my micronutrients. And then I'll take a fiber supplement before bed for the fiber. It, it, you know, this is not about living to be 90. This is about yeah. being, you know, 250 on stage. So they're, they're right. two different objectives. That's what I, I try to tell people. If you're trying to live a long life or trying to bodybuild, <laughs> they kind of run counter to each yeah. other. Uh, you know, that's not to say that you can't be healthier with bodybuilding. Like I really try to keep my saturated fats low, um, you know, for cardiovascular health. I know people will argue with me about that, but I, it, I've just seen it in blood work over and over and over again, where you push the saturated fats, right. high, your, your lipids get skewed and skewed lipids and taking PEDs is not a good combination. No. Um, uh, no, if I were just living for longevity, I'd probably eat more of a Mediterranean style diet, probably more vegetables, light meat, um, you know, uh, more sa essential fatty acids, things like that. Um, that's probably what I would do for longevity, maybe some intermittent fasting or something like that. But it's really, if you want to live a long time, the, the secret is to eat less food. Right. And, and to be small, like literally to have the one yeah. of the lowest body weights yeah. you possibly can. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and you we want to lower... You want to lower mTOR if you're trying to yeah. live forever. It, 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 you want to raise it if you're trying to get big. So they, they are just they're, they run counter to each other. Yeah, literally like the, the longevity pathway is the the uh, pathway you do like that activates when you're doing cardio. It's escaping me. It's not AKT. That's insulin. Um, it's um, oh my gosh, metformin activates the pathway. It's super obvious. AMP kinase. Um, MP kinase, yeah. Completely opposing to mTOR, and that's the one you want to get the most of or activate the most when you're right. gaming for longevity. But it's completely counterintuitive to a lot of what we're trying to do. Yeah, you know, like lowering IGF one, you want lower IGF one if you want to live a long time. Uh, you know, because higher IGF one is more cell replic replication, and yeah. that shortens shortens lifespan and increases odds of getting cancer, things like that. So, you know, it's, they're two different goals. So probably when I do hang up the bodybuilding, uh, um, trunks, I will, I will downsize. Yeah. It, it's just, it's just what I will do. I probably, I probably go down to like 220, 215. That's a good weight. That's a really yeah. Good weight. That, that, that's probably where I would like to be. It, that, that should be easy for me to maintain. Yeah. And, and touching on the vegetables, I mean, really all we're aiming for is fiber at the end of the day. So I, I use yeah. And for most of my clients, I just have them take Metamucil. And, and yeah, it's what not I do. like you're getting a ton of nutrients from vegetables. Like you're going to really have to pound the vegetables to get any reasonable amount of nutrients. And with the amount of protein we're consuming, I think we're probably touching the majority of our bases with just sheer protein volume. And the vegetables are kind of like the icing on the, on the cake sort of sense. So the only well, I tell reason people, we... I tell people if you're eat, like you look at a salad, when, when you eat it, you shit it all back out. So I'm like, yeah. how, much, 
how many micronutrients are you really getting from it if, if right. the cabbage and the uh, greens are still in your poop? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, it's it's just the, the gut motility we're looking for. So like something like Metamucil, if you don't like vegetables, it's perfect. And it's, it's interesting you said that about saturated fat too, because there's a lot of correlation there, you know, with especially PED users, because we can, it's apparent that saturated fat, non-esterified, can uh, enter intramuscular triglycerides and like create marbling in, in, in muscle yep. tissue and create insulin insensitivity. So it, it's interesting, especially when you pair it with insulin, it can create like a really negative reaction, exogenous insulin. But I, I have seen, what's interesting to me is like when you eat cholesterol, a lot of it is esterified and, and can't be digested. So about 90% of the cholesterol we absorb is created from our body. Correct. And it's just reabsorbed through our bile salts that secreted through the liver uh, and the bilirubin, uh, bilirubin system. But it, I think like there has to be some mechanism where, and I've never seen this, this literature, but where steroids or exogenous hormones are impacting like enterocytes. So you absorb more cholesterol because obviously like everyone knows you, you hop on, you can keep the diet exactly the same and you're going to see an elevation in cholesterol levels. I don't know what that is. Have you seen anything? Yeah. I mean, it goes, it does, you know, every blood panel I look at LDL goes up, HDL goes down with the same diet. So I, I don't know. My, my thought process was that it had some sort of impact on the liver yeah. and the way liver, the yeah. liver handles lipids. I, I don't know, but I mean, that's just me speculating. Uh, but that that's just kind of kind of my thought process on it. I I'm sure there's some maybe there's some literature out there on it. I don't know. Um I'm actually doing an interview with uh Dr. Todd tonight. I could ask him, see what yeah, he that'd be a really good question. Says. But but I mean he and I have talked about it before, but he was just saying how <laughs> eating a lot of saturated fats with, with PEDs is just a really bad idea. Yeah. You're, you're you know, now it there is you know, we got to remember that correlation is not always causation, but there, there, there certainly is a correlation there. So, it, you know, it, it's people that tend to have cardiovascular events have skewed lipids. Mm. You know, that doesn't mean that everybody with skewed lipids has cardiovascular events. Right. But they're certainly correlative in nature to cardiovascular events. So why take the risk? And then plus, like you said, it, it's counterproductive to insulin use too. So mm. if you're trying to maintain insulin sensitivity in the muscle cell, um, having uh, intramuscular lipids is is counterproductive to that, and and um, and uh, everybody that I talk to that says that insulin sucks for bodybuilding are the dudes that eat like shit. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen that when when you keep your fats low, um, carbohydrates high, and and leverage insulin, and you do high volume training along with it, that that's when you maximize the mm -hmm. uh, the the uh the fact that insulin has yeah i completely and i've seen that too myself like i've personally you know used so i worked with um this is no dismarch to him but alex kekel have you heard of him oh yeah Al yeah alex is pretty, um, pretty sure. didn't enjoy my experience he's a good guy i think he has great intentions but he, he bases a lot of what he does off mechanism um and, and so he his thing was like he'd have you use insulin with like dirty cheat meals like really dirty cheat meals yeah that makes zero sense to me yeah and i i dude my like my gut would just like my waistline just exploded and i'm like well this is i'm i'm in my mind i'm like this is literally my liver getting fat like this is what this is you know? yeah it's it's visceral fat accumulation mm -hmm. that's what that's what happens that's what i've seen happen anecdotally when you look yeah. at it when people eat fats with with uh with insulin use they just accumulate visceral fat yeah yeah, they, they become insulin resistant and they accumulate visceral fat. So, uh, you know, I, and that's another thing too. Like people are like, oh, you can't take metformin and, and gain size. I'm like, that that's bullshit because <laughs> I know people like to cite the study where uh, it inhibited IGF one production, but that was on a 60 year old non lifting dudes so right. that doesn't apply to our cohort. And if you're jamming GH and insulin with it, your IGF one is going to be plenty high, even with metformin but they but you know my thought process is like with metformin and berberine you're doing things to synthetically enhance insulin um, sensitivity while using insulin and you keep your carbohydrate carbohydrates high and fats low you're going to maximize glycogen production yeah I, it's just what i've seen and you minimize uh visceral fat accumulation it's usually when people become insulin resistant 
uh, from eating a shit ton of saturated fats and shit like that, then they, they become insulin resistant and then they, they get the, what people call the GH gut. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually from the GH because those guys shrink back up after they stop bodybuilding. So if it right. was actual intestinal growth or organ growth, that wouldn't happen. Right. I mean, look, if you look at Dave Palumbo, his protocol is McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. So it's like, you know, there, I, I think, like you said, there's a correlation there. It's curious to say the least, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, and there are some people, you know, I haven't trained a lot of people. There are some people I have to give some trash to just to get them to grow. They're just, mm -hmm. it, it's wildly different how some people respond, but for the large swath of people aren't that way. I think those are outliers. Yeah. The, those types of people are outliers. The majority of people tend to get just fat when they do it that way. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of, we got a couple questions I want to get to. Um, sure. I, I do have two questions for you. So in, in your videos, you talked about acid reflux and I'm curious as to see um, why you're taking a proton pump inhibitor as opposed to something like a, a betaine HCL plus cups in to increase stomach acid. Well, I have, um, so I'll back up. My acid reflux is not really acid reflux. I have a hiatal hernia. Um, so actually my stomach will, will burp up into my esophagus. So I, this is what my, um, what my um, gastroenterologist suggested is that I want to lower acid production to keep it from getting up into my esophagus. Yeah. I actually had an ulcer in my esophagus and it was oh, sure. burning up, burning a hole in my esophagus. And I know of two people personally that have passed away from esophageal cancer from uh, uncontrolled acid reflux. A lot of bodybuilders too, and I've seen a lot of people that lift have hiatal hernias and don't realize it too, because I, from what I understand, it's from a lot of guys that brace when they're doing heavy lifts, like squats and deadlifts. Uh, the hiatal hernia, I don't know if you know how it works, but your stomach has a small, it's, I think it's a ligament that attaches to the diaphragm to keep it in place. And that tears a lot of times when you're holding your breath and don't, and don't lift. So guys end up, they think they have acid reflux, but it's not really fucking acid reflux. It's a hiatal hernia. Interesting. And so their yeah, stomach's so, just kind of thrashing around and it's. Yeah. Your stomach up. just jerks around and thrashes around and, and, um, you know, and that stuff just comes up, um, it comes up into your, into your stomach. And then sometimes the flap that, uh, that, um, I forget the name of it. Uh, it's the, like the sphincter that, that, uh, uh, is like a gateway from the stomach to the, to the esophagus won't close completely as well. Yeah. So stuff like that. So in, in those instances, when you're having increased, um, acid production is not a good thing. Yeah. We're trying to cut down on acid that gets up in there. And I think I overproduce acid anyway. It's just, a, you know, me speculating, but, um, you know, this, this is, was the protocol that my gastroenterologist came up with. For sure. I'm not an expert on stomach health. I, I'm not, I'm not going to proclaim to be one. Have you experienced any like digestive issues with that or trouble digesting protein? I, I, I have ba I'm better with it. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't get all the stomach issues. Like I used to get like occasionally get diarrhea and, um, IBS. It seems to cut down on my IBS when I use it. That's awesome. That's really yeah, and I've seen that in a lot of people that, that use use them. I, I know they're not the right solution for everybody. Uh, I, I know there are some people that don't make enough stomach acid, and that can be an issue too. Right. Absolutely. What do you think about kind of touching on acid reflux? There's a lot of, especially the younger generation that utilizes uh, orals during the pushing phase or the off season. Do you have an opinion on that i know there's a lot of educators in the space that say that's completely useless uh and, and deleterious to your health for no reason do you have a particular opinion yeah i don't i don't advise oral use in the off season so i i look when i i i look at steroids as a tool in the tool belt and they all they all have unique properties and there really are really when you look at the unique properties like let's let's take anadrol really anadrol the only thing that anadrol provides that's uniquely uh special is force production so we're not power lifters so I really don't care about force production. Right. Uh, something like Winstrol is, is, enhances body composition. Anavar is good for glucocorticoid uh, suppression and also body composition. Uh, I, I just don't see any value. There's not really orals don't do anything better for the most part than you can do with an injectable and they have more side effects and they're harsher on the stomach with uh, because of the methylation. I, I just don't see any advantage to using them in the off season. 
they have all of the side effects without any additional benefits. So to me, that seems like a, just a dumb choice. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know why you would, and everybody that, that does them, like, it seems like it eventually ends up crushing your appetite too. And mm -hmm. long term, right. like I see guys talk about it in their 20s. You know, I, you know, I love e-ball. I love this. I love that. It's always the guys in the 20s that, that say that. It, it, yeah. when, once you get, I talk to pro bodybuilders all the time. And I, the guys that are, that are pros that have been doing this for a while, none of them use orals in the off season. None of them. Yeah. It's funny because I had a 21 year old come up to me in the gym and he's like asking me all these questions. He's seen my content before. And he's like, so I wanted to like kind of run my cycle by you and get, get an idea of what you think. And the first word that came out of his mouth was a D ball kickstart. He's doing a D ball kickstart. I'm like, dude, like there's, this is 2022, man. There's no reason to be doing this. Like just put that shit on the shelf and, wait your time like you well, know. That, that that whole thing drives me nuts too the whole front loading thing that you, the beginning of the cycle you should be able to get by with with less yeah you right. don't need you don't need a ton and usually a lot of times what ends up happening when you throw a bunch everything in the kitchen sink at it at the beginning you just end up with a bunch of extra side effects right a bunch of estrogen conversion and dht conversion and just blood pressure goes through the roof unnecessarily i usually titrate my cycles up Mm -hmm. um, um through through the period of you know i might start off i start off really low and then i'll just push up and i don't have a i don't have sort of a target goal where for load i just you know if i hit hit a sticking point um i'll try food first and if that doesn't get me past it then i'll i'll push up um my my anabolic load a bit and yeah to try that's to bust through plateaus that's exactly how i do it. i look at it so the scale is going up, but my strength isn't. I probably need to add androgens into the equation. If my yep. scale isn't going up, but my strength's great in the gym, I probably need to add food. It's just kind of like yep. the balance between that. Yeah, that's a that's a very I like that approach. That's a very yeah. simple, easy approach. I just don't see. I look at the cost to benefit ratio of everything. I just don't see where orals provide any additional benefit for the health costs in the off season. Now contest prep, that's a different story. Uh, you know, I, I will use orals at the end of contest prep. That, that is the time that you mash the gas pedal down, and there's some unique body composition benefits that you can get from certain orals or, or, or even glucocorticoid suppression, right. things like that, that you can't get from. The same thing with trend. Like, I know people love to run trend in the off season. I just don't see any additional benefit to running trend in the off season. Now, contest prep, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's the only the only real scenario in which I'd use orals would be like a intermittent anavar dosage because it's metabolized yeah. by the kidneys for like a, a very prioritized body part. Like let's say you're trying to train legs. I want that neurological drive before the session so you can pull a little bit more strength out of you. That's the only time I think it, it'd be justifiable though. Like yeah, once a week, would... twice a week type thing. That would be my caveat yeah, it, as well. I have used, and I will say that, that in the past, not this year, but I have used Anavar and spot duty as a pre-workout. Yeah. To, for neural drive. Yes. And, and, and honestly, I, I have used Anadrol that way before too. Like yeah. I'll just maybe like once or twice a week, just like you said, on a weak body part, I'll take, I'll take Anadrol sublingually um, to miss the first pass of the liver. <laughs> Um, yeah. mostly miss the first pass of the liver. It's not entirely missed, but, um, and that takes some of the toxicity out of it. Uh, so that's just kind of been my, my approach to it, but I, w once in a blue moon, but I really, I really don't even do that anymore. Yeah. Um, so a question on here, and, and it leads me to another question I had, he, this guy asked, how soon does Proviron kick in at how many weeks does it come with diminishing returns? So I don't know necessarily what kind of answer he's looking for there. I'm trying to remember the Proviron half life. I think it's it's longer. It's like seventy two hours, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's it's above. I, I believe it's three days or above. I can't exactly remember either. But yeah, yeah, I think I think it's something like seventy two hours. So in theory, it would it would peak in seventy two hours. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, the only, the only reason I use, I mean, Proviron in contest prep really is just to crush SHBG. Do you I mean, think that's what's my next question? Do you think there's, cause like I'm with another coach now, he loves super dosing provider, like mega dosing the shit out of it. Do you think there's a utility in that? Have you seen textural changes in, in body composition with it? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've definitely seen changes in body composition and free tests will go up as well. Yeah. Um, and now in the off season, I don't know if it's a good idea to crush your SHBG. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't, I don't think that's a good idea, but in, in contest prep, yes, I do use provider in my contest prep stack. What's like your max dosage usually? I usually is, I'll usually start off with 50 and then I work up to 100. Yeah. 
and I'll run it like the last six weeks. Yeah. Um, but cool. but I have I. I I, I have sort of sort of the kitchen sink approach at it on contest prep, but I usually like the first half of contest prep. I, I, I kind of give you how I run things. I usually start off really low, just like an off season um, with, with my anabolics. Usually just test in primaval and uh, something like that uh, is what I'll use. And then about eight weeks out, I'll add in the trend um, yeah. and trend and usually trend and master on. And then about four to six weeks out, I'll start adding in the orals. Um, this past year, I ran, um, I ran, uh, I, let's see, I ran Anovar starting six weeks out, and Proviron, I started six weeks out, and then three weeks out, I added Halotestin in, at 10 milligrams, and then went to 20 the last two weeks. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's, that's, that's what I did. That's what I did this year. I, I ran Halo instead of Winstrol. Um, I've always been scared of Halo. I don't know why. I, I had I had way better results with Halo than I did with um with uh with Winstraw. I, I I think Halo you get that additional neural drive and like mm-hmm. when you get to the end of contest prep you, you're not you really your yeah. your strength is not very good and you're fatigued and I think that um that additional neural drive from the Halo testing was beneficial for uh training. Did you see any like texture changes within your skin? Yeah I did get harder with the uh with with, with with the halo all the wind straw makes me really hard but the problem i have with wind straw is my joints hurt like fuck uh and i don't want to lift so i don't know how beneficial that is so i i just did an experiment this year and tried halo instead of wind straw at the end and i and i think i got better results because of it yeah i did did you mention that you did blood work after using it too i can't remember yeah i mean you know what you know what's bad right no i well you know what i ran um uh, I ran uh, Tukta NAC and uh, Milk Thistle this year, and mm-hmm. I never run the NAC this before. And I, my liver values were below normal range running That's the so NAC. And my previous contest prep, my liver, my ALT and AST were both over 300. <laughs> so, and then this year they were in the 30s. After Interesting. Running, after running Halo. Now, I, kept, I was only running 30 milligrams of Anavar. So it wasn't like anything crazy. And, um, and then the halo, like I said, it was only three weeks. I started off with 10 um, and, then, and then 20. So that was really all I did for orals. Okay, interesting. Um, kind of moving over to another question in, in my mind. When you're in the off season, uh, you're pushing a blast. Are you having to control estrogen or do you just kind of let that shit fly? I have been experimenting with how I stack things, and um, I have been running Primabolin with uh, testosterone, and uh, I know people will say that, you know, there's no evidence. I know I've seen studies that say there's no evidence that Primabolin suppresses estrogen, but I've seen it over and over and over and over again in blood work. Um, you know, you would think that really logically that all DHTs are sort of suppressive of estradiol, but... If I run primavolin in a one-to-one ratio with my testosterone, I don't need an AI mm. at all. Do you ever, you know, do you ever test your actual E2 levels via blood work? Or? Yeah, yeah. I just, I just had them done. They were in, they were around sixty. Oh, wow, um, that's pretty good. Yeah, with, with, at you know, you know, running uh, five hundred tests, five hundred primo right now. Um, but I, I, uh, I generally try not to use uh, a, an aromatase inhibitor in the off season. Okay. I mean, I, f- I found that 60 seems to be the sweet spot for me for IGF-1 conversion. Yeah. Um, it, it, and it's kind of the sweet spot with IGF because the higher the estrogen, the better IGF-1 conversion you're going to get. Uh, but the, uh, the issue is, is like if I get above, I've noticed like if I get up above 70 or 80, then, then I start having ED and yeah. – um, sex drive issues so 60 seems in the 60 seems to be about as high as i can push it yeah it, there's you know i, I try, i'm trying I to saw somebody make... sorry about i saw somebody mention masteron masteron's an alternative too it's just yeah. sort of poor man's prima bowling yeah i mean masteron was developed for uh the prevention of female breast uh, cancer development so yeah that one's like directly attaching to the uh, or it's inhibiting the estrogen receptor beta um I mean, so, on paper, Masteron's not as anabolic as right as Primabol, and I don't know how much that trans in, transitions into practicality. But I do think people overlook Masteron as a possibility in the off season, if for nothing else, for estrogen management. 
for sure. I see. Yeah, I see. Sure. Chase Irons is yeah. watching. He's. He said, "What's up, Chase?" Uh, he said that he agrees. One. He said. He said when he gives them joint pain only too. So, I've never experienced that personally. My joints have been always pretty spot on. Well, how old are you? Being... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My joints were great when I was your age too, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the it's an old man problem. Estrogen, thing though that the high estrogen so i'm making a video about this or well, i have a video coming out tomorrow about this but um uh, i did like a deep dive into estrogen because I, I you know there's a lot of people who preach like keep that as high as possible now don't use ais and and then you go really you dive into men with hyper estrogen anemia which they have too much estrogen and these guys are you know their ejection fracture drops by 20 percent um, yeah, in estrogen levels at 80 to 90, uh, which is, you know, terrifying. And then if you look at male patients with heart failure, currently, their estrogen levels are also far beyond uh, the reference ranges and their prolactin levels. So there is some correlation with like too high of estrogen leading to heart and cardiac deterioration. Um, so I always find it interesting when, you know, people say like, let that shit go high. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the best idea. I think. No, I, I think it's the a terrible upper idea. Yeah. I think, I think it's a terrible idea. There, there is an upper into it. 100% there is an upper into it. And not, not just that, you know, just the, the, the water retention too. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, all, all, carry, carrying all that excess water is not good for your heart, your blood pressure, your kidneys. Not at all. And at usually all. when you look at the shit that kills bodybuilders, it's cardiovascular or, or kid, kidney health. Yeah, yeah that's, it, that's usually what, what get us. I don't, I don't know how carrying all that extra water would be beneficial. And right. estrogen does cause water retention. <laughs> At least with me, I, I get bloated up like a pig. Oh yeah, if, if, I, if I let my estrogen get too high. I was looking at pictures of me just from like 16 weeks ago. My face is just like, like it's just so round because I'm like I don't mind it too high either. So it gets really round. I'm like, man, that's that looks gnarly. Um, do you check your because you're talking about lipids, do you check your APOEB? No, I don't. I should. Okay. So the the interesting thing is there when when people talk about like LDL and HDL, when you get those measurements from a lab, it's it's LDLC and HDLC. It's just measuring the cholesterol in those lipoproteins. So all it yeah. is is a total measurement of cholesterol. It's not actually the quantity of lipoproteins you have. So I always caution bodybuilders, like, hey, if you're going to actually want to measure your lipids to see which deleterious lipids you have and how much of them, APOEB is like the way to go. Because that's like the chylomicron that's hosting all of those uh, cholesterol molecules is what's going to be shown when you measure APOEB, whereas LDLC and HDLC is just the total cholesterol number. And then they estimate how many, how much general cholesterol you might have. Um, but I was curious if, if you ever did that because I I've done it and then you know an easy solution is because it's been high right on on a higher dose of testosterone it's definitely been a higher number which that's obviously horrible for you um, and at a zetamib at ten milligrams like drops it right back down into range so I was just curious yeah I do run a zetamib sometimes as well um, I, I I I have, I have used it but it does upset upset my stomach sometimes really. Yeah, I've got a super sensitive stomach, so I, I've had issues with azetamide causing me to <laughs> blow yeah. my ass out. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, I, I could ask you questions all day, man. So I'm sorry if you got to go. Let me know. Um, no, I'm, I'm I'm free. Is is there anything that you think? And I know you're like the reason I, I love following you, Paul. Is you're a very conventional guy. Like you, you tell it like it is. It's just straight facts, right? So it's partly your opinion, partly what you've seen and in, in your experience, and partly science. Um, and I love that. And my question is, because there's all of these people pontificating new chemicals to, to experiment with and potential growth pathways that could become a real thing in the future. Do you see anything that you would like to try yourself? Or is it just like, hey, I, I got my meat and potatoes, the Prima Bowl and the testosterone, the equipoise, like we're good to go? You know, I've been at this a long time and I'm going to sound like the grumpy old man here. But <laughs> people aren't any bigger now than they were 30 years ago. Yeah, you know, even with all the new shit, and you know, I I remember when um, I remember like when all the SARMs came around, like everybody was like, "This is the next next big thing. Everybody's going to grow. Everybody's going to be huge. Everybody's going to be big." I see somebody mentioned Trastolone. That's another yeah. one. You know, like uh, you know, all this this is going to take everybody to the next level. <laughs> But the, Jay Siren said DHB and mint is all you need, bro. <laughs> yeah, DHB and mint is all you need, bro. But like, 
the dudes of the fucking nineties were just taking tests and equipoise right. and and nobody's any bigger than Doreen Yates was. Yeah. It may, maybe Big Romney, you know, right. but I, you know, and I recently, you gotta be careful what I say, but I recently had a conversation with somebody who's close to Big Romney and he, you want to take a guess of what that dude takes in the off season? I, I bet it's like, it's depressing how low it is probably. It, he takes test, equipoise and prima bowling. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what, that's what, in some GH. And, yeah. You know, just basic shit. He just eats the, the the thing I've heard from people that know Big Rami, his superpower is he has a, a bottomless stomach. The dude can just fucking eat. You know, and that's that's really the thing that nobody wants to hear. Like like everybody's looking for the next great compound. And I, I put a video up recently that I, I guess it kind of went viral. It, it, I, I got like 5,000 followers on Instagram after this video went up. But uh, um about eating like a bodybuilder and everybody got so butt oh, hurt. Yeah, the comments in that one. Everybody got so butt hurt, man. And I, I you know, I'm just like, that's the secret. Everybody misses it. I, I mean, there's only so much muscle protein synthesis you can stimulate with, with drugs. Yeah. And the part that everybody misses is the food. Mm. So I don't know. I, I, I sound like the grumpy old man saying that, but I, I'm like, just eat a shit ton of meat and rice take basic anabolics, you know, maybe, you know, maybe insulin and GH, that would be the other pathways. Uh, and if you can't get big off of that, you probably don't have the genetics to be a bodybuilder. No, I just don't, I don't know what else to say. I mean, there's, no. I don't know, I, you know, outside of, you know, maybe true myostatin inhibit in, in, inhibition, but I, I've, I've heard, I've heard of that, you know, or maybe gene therapy, some yeah. stuff coming down the road actually changing your genetics, but I don't know that there's any, any compound that I, you know, myostatin inhibition is, is interesting, but I, they, they've been saying that that's the Holy Grail for 30 years and I haven't seen right. anything happen with that. And, and it's just scary, right? Like in theory, let's say you can inhibit myostatin. What's going to stop your heart from growing, your lungs from growing, your stomach from growing. And that's, that's the theory with Dallas McCarver because his, his heart and his liver were just so massive. Like he maybe had yeah. access to something that was potentially inhibiting myostatin. Like his, there's cases, like case studies where these animals that they're testing on actually had like their stomach like explode out of them because it got so big so quickly. So it's like, even it might, it might sound good. It's like, how do we know it can be super selective to just skeletal muscle? That's right. Just, yeah. I don't, I, that's the issue. It, it right. probably isn't. Um, you know, and I guess that was the kind of the, the fascinating thing with SARMs, although people forget that anabolics are SARMs too, yeah. uh, but, uh, the selective binding to the, to the, the tissue, um, you know, I guess that was sort of like why people thought that was the Holy grail that you could grow, grow muscle tissue specifically, but it, none of it ever really proved out to be much of anything. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the truth is, is that the shit that's already there is probably about as good as it gets. Yeah. Usually, usually, if it's illegal, it's good. <laughs> so, <laughs> Factual. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, I sound like the grumpy old man. No, I, I agree with you 100%. I think, honestly, like if you can get a good dose of testosterone, uh, a moderate dose of insulin and growth hormone, you're probably going to grow pretty damn well for a <laughs> very long time, for a very long time. Well, I've seen it over and over with my clients. Like I get guys that come to me that just overcomplicate things and overthink shit. Right. And I put them, I put them on a really solid diet and we'll just run tests and an anabolic that works for them. We figure out what anabolic works for them, maybe a little GH and a little insulin and they transform. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. And it's really the big difference is it's getting the basics, training hard, getting your food in really the food is the missing ingredient for 99 percent of people they just yeah. don't want to hear it right that's that was my thing when i was working with alex it was like you know t 13 different drugs at very specific times throughout the day and like you had to do this at this time and like very carefully dose this at this time and it was like you know the diet was just like hey you eat 50 grams of protein from whatever source you want it could be fucking like, whey protein powder it could be protein cereal i'm like i don't know man like that like I'm, I'm, my degree is in science and nutrition. And I know very damn well that like incomplete proteins are not going to satisfy the, the needs of the body. Uh, and it's just like, he was more concerned about the minutia and like the very specific details. And I saw zero growth. And then I get on with uh, blue Taylor's my coach. Now he's old school, like fucking old school. 
And it's just like the, the basic stuff. And like you said, it's just like, I went from 170 pounds and in a year I got up to 255 pounds and now I'm back down to, you know, pretty damn near stage condition at 210. So it's like, you know, the basic stuff works. Yeah. And I, you know, and I see it, uh, th that's, that's what I call the 3%, <laughs> you yeah. know, so people get so they're it, it, incredibly intelligent. People a lot of times will get hyper-focused on the 3% and overlook the 97%. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, in a, yeah. So, I mean, maybe if you're an Olympia competitor, that might be what gets you from fifth place up to second or, or, or first. I don't, I don't know, but you know, when you're, Joe Schmo that's just trying to gain some weight, you know, just amateur bodybuilder, button up the 97 first. Right. I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it. Get, get, get the basics buttoned up first. I, I, I used to do jujitsu all the time and uh, I trained jujitsu all the time. And it was just like, you get these brand new people that would come in wanting to learn all, all, all the fancy moves and shit. And, I, and I'm like, dude, just, just, just do the basics. You know, if, yeah. if you learn how to fucking choke somebody, uh, you know, you know, or do an arm bar, you're, you're gonna be able to beat up 95% of people in the world. Don't don't worry about some fancy twister move or some <laughs> shit. Just, you're, you're, you're not good enough to know that yet. Right, exactly. Just focus um, on the basics. I mean, same thing with football. I mean, when you when you get, you know, you look at I was an athlete when I was younger or, or basketball. If you can shoot the ball, if you can shoot the ball really well and dribble the ball, you're gonna do pretty well. Yeah, but you know, we're worrying about you know this and that and you know overcomplicated shit when you can't shoot the ball or can't dribble doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Blocking, blocking, and tackling in football. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. One one fella asks here kind of about that minutia. He asks if there's side effects for if side effects aren't an issue, is there an upper end to GH dosing? I'll say to that it's contextual depending on what like if you're trying to burn fat. You, you don't really want to go over two IUs. It's about like what the research kind of shows is about 1.5 IUs of GH for lipolysis. I don't know what your opinion is about the anabolic side of that though. Yeah, I, f I found that like people that use GH for fat burning, there there are things that do it better and do it cheaper. <laughs> just another yeah. one, like like just use some fucking clenbuterol, man, yeah. and, and 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 do a calorie deficit uh, if if your budget's limited. But yeah, I yeah two two units of GH is is about what I've found is is fine for for fat burning. I mean, just experimenting anecdotally on myself. Um, somewhere between six and eight units is the sweet spot. I, I go more than eight units. I can't feel my hands <laughs> and my mm -hmm. insulin sensitivity starts going to shit. Right. Um, and I, I'll, I'll see my fasting glucose levels start, start, uh, eight limits is about my limit. Uh, it, it, I, I tried 10 before and I, I couldn't, my hands got so numb. I couldn't, couldn't type. And I, my fasting glucose levels were up to like 130, 140, which is not good. That's yeah. <laughs> it's diabetic <laughs> yeah yeah no it's diabetic um and then you know when i pull back down to six and use a little bit of metformin i got them down back below 100 but that just shows you how powerful gh is at inducing insulin resistance yeah. so like i laugh when people think that that pro bodybuilders are running 20 units of gh too like that all, that's another one that makes me laugh i'm like who the fuck can afford that <laughs> right it's great and you hear stories about like gh 15 and 15 units a day it's like Dude, I would literally be just living to buy a growth hormone at that point. It's crazy. Well, I did the math on it at one point. If you're getting pharmaceutical grade GH, it's like a hundred grand a year in GH. Yeah, that's nuts, dude. Unless you know you have some sort of ridiculous sponsor, but like I just I, like people pontificate that those guys are using dosages like that. I'm like, who? who like even if you win Mr. Olympia, you're all that prize money is going straight back into growth hormone. Like I don't see people doing that realistically. I, I got to talk to Jay Cutler last year for a, a fair fair amount of time. Uh, I, I had the the luxury of talking to him, and he was talking about it. He was like, he's like, he never took more than eight because he said that's all I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> that's and awesome. He was like, I don't know where people think that we get this shit for free because I paid for it and got it from the same places that everybody else did. <laughs> I saw somebody ask about generic versus uh, pharma. That that's a good question too. I. I get that one frequently, and my, the the thing with the generic whole argument with generic versus pharma, it's either one ninety one amino acids or it's not. Right. It's it's it either, it either is real or it's not. Now you could argue with the dosing whether the dosing is accurate on the on the generics, but I I run generics. I there, I've seen zero difference between the generics. Yeah. 
And I have a buddy of mine that's a pharmaceutical researcher. It works, I, I won't say which company, but he works for one of the big companies that makes GH. And he said, there's only about four factories in the whole fucking world that make GH. And the generic stuff is rolling out of the same factories as oh, the yeah. pharma grade. He said, it's just the powder they have left over at the end of the day in the factory in China <laughs> uh, when they're making the, the, the genotropin. Yeah. They just, they just slap it in a blue top and, you know, it may not be measured out as accurately. Now, I do think the handling and the shipping of it, I think that's where a lot of times where people uh, think that they are getting fake or shitty stuff, you know, when it's mm -hmm. been put on a cargo ship and shipped from China and it's been exposed to, you know, 100 degree heat on the ocean or whatever, it's probably ruined or it's, right. or it's degraded um in your it's just not as strong as it was when it left the factory but I, I think for the most part most of the generic gh now is solid yeah i i have uh had the opportunity to my friend was a nurse in college and uh he would sell me growth hormone out of the refrigerator out of the back of the house, <laughs> literally That's a good and, yeah it was great it was great and uh I, I wanted to do that test so i did the old 10 units of gh sub q go get my blood work done test the levels did that with the pharma grade and just I, I what I used to do was buy generics from Alibaba.com for like sixty bucks a kit, and that shit was real. It, you know, my IGF one, my growth hormone, they were both the same on each uh, compound pharmaceutical or generic. So I've never seen practical evidence to say that generics aren't just as useful. And, and I agree with you; like it matters the denaturing of those protein matters in its handling. But you know, you're that's you, who knows to say that. If you buy pharmaceutical grade, the underground lab that sold you that is going to be handling it appropriately either, you know? Right. I mean, it's still getting shipped from Turkey or wherever the fuck it's coming from. So right. it's, it's, it's the same, same level of ship. And I, I, I've actually heard, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard it speculated that the pharmaceutical stuff is actually more likely to be counterfeited because there's so much profit I, I believe from it, from it than, than the generics. The guys that are yeah. selling the generics want return customers. Right. Uh, um, you know, it used to be back in the day, I, and I don't know that this is the case anymore, but, you know, I remember in the early 2000s that a lot of fake uh, GH was actually HC, HCG. But, yeah, I've, you know, I've heard of that, too. I've heard of them putting like, diuretics in uh, growth hormone, too, to make it seem like you get uh, swollen from it or whatever. It's like a fake side effect. Yeah, I've heard of that too. But I, I, I've been running the cheap Chinese blue tops for the most part. I, I have spent the money on the expensive stuff once in a while. But I, when I get my blood work done, I mean, my IGF one levels are just as yeah. high on the, on, on the, on the blue tops. Yeah, um, we got a guy asks. He's hey, I'm 51. Want to get on something, but not too crazy. I'm in good health. Been working out for five years straight, all natural, 175 pounds. What can I do to maybe just add 20 pounds of muscle? I'd say just get on a higher dose of TRT, like 300 milligrams, run it for a long time, see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think an old man's best friend is just test GH, you know, yeah. maybe maybe a little insulin if you want to run insulin. I, that's that's another thing that I've seen um, that it seems to be a limiting factor in older guys. You're a young guy, so you probably you haven't experienced this, but I think a lot of guys as they get older, insulin sensitivity declines and then also they have issues with insulin production as well so i think that's why a lot of guys that are older don't grow and i've seen where i've been able to get older guys to grow that couldn't grow is to get get their insulin sensitivity straightened out and to get them on just a little bit of insulin to help maybe some, a basal insulin like lantus or something to help with insulin production and then they start growing again because of uh if you're not making enough insulin and your insulin sensitivity sucks you're not going to uptake nutrients properly absolutely and i've seen that a lot in older guys like young guys like in your 20s you shouldn't have to do that right yeah i mean i can pound like a disgusting ass treat meal on my blood glucose in the mornings like an 89 at most so yeah you're lucky i can't do that yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I i i need like my body just literally just does not I, i've come to the conclusion just does not make enough insulin and i kind of troubleshoot it uh the way i figure it out with an older guy is i'll, I'll have them start measuring their glucose levels and we'll experiment with things like berberine first. Um, and if berberine doesn't bring down fasted glucose levels, and then we'll try metformin. If that doesn't bring down fasted glucose levels, then uh, the uh, the logic behind it uh, is that then it's just uh, a lack of insulin production. I mean, that's just what, what my... Um, somebody was asking, uh, does exogenous insulin 
still fatigue the beta cells. That no, no it actually takes That's pressure the whole off point. the beta. Yeah. It's, it's opposite. You can actually make an argument for using if you're a bodybuilder pounding a bunch of food. You you can make an argument for using something like a basal insulin like Lantus prophylactically to take pressure off to prevent diabetes later on. Now it could could increase insulin resistance. You know, more insulin is you know you're pounding the cell with more insulin than than. Right. It, but I also think that insulin resistance has is more complicated than that. It has to do with shitty diet and lack of activity and all that, all that yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I think uh, a lot of that has to do with what you said. And, and then there's a lot of data showing like training to failure can really like the intramuscular non-esterified fatty acids or saturated fatty acids that I talked about earlier, training to failure can actually, uh, actually break up that fatty acid into a non-esterified. That's interesting. I didn't, the, I never heard it. I, I can say the paper. It's, a, it's actually a really good paper. And again, it's in general population. So who's to say that their failure is an R like two RIR, three RIR. So, you know, but, um, I need, I need to get you on my channel sometime, man, for an interview. <laughs> <We can talk. laughs> I love talking. Man. It's good. Um, this guy asks, you know, is for a second cycle, he wants to, he did for his first cycle, he did 250 milligrams of test for his second cycle. He's wondering what he can do to take it up a notch. <clears throat> I would just, Pick an anabolic you're curious, curious about and try it out and see how it works with the test. Yeah. I'd say that or even just see if how far – I would see how far you can bring test up without needing an AI or anything like that before you start accumulating side effects. Yeah, usually I, I, I get a little more aggressive than probably some people do, but I, usually on the first cycle, I'll have guys, have guys slowly titrate up from – um, usually one uh, milligram per pound of body weight up to about two to three milligrams per pound of body yeah. weight, uh, yeah. just just to see where the limit is. Um, but I'll, I'll do it over a 16 to 20 week course on a first cycle just to kind of test that out so we can just get that out of the way. Um, and I, I found, you know, most new users, you know, somewhere between 300 and 500 milligrams is, is about the limit uh, of where they can get away without an AI. Um, but I, 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 I mean, this is my approach. I, I like testing out a second compound just to see, see how you respond to something like test or equipoise or prima volant, um, yeah. for a second cycle. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, with that question, does exogenous insulin still fatigue the beta cells? There's actually really good research showing that Lantus or that basal insulin can cause uh, beta cell synthesis, so the development of new beta cells, which is pretty fucking interesting stuff. Um, what are your thoughts on testosterone for a younger guy instead of going straight into pinning? Don't I'll be honest. Yeah, don't waste, don't, time. Don't, don't, don't waste your time. Don't don't yeah. give Greg Doucette money. Yeah, it's just a complete waste of time. It, you literally a, a bottle of Anavar would be cheaper. You can take five milligrams a day. It won't impact your hepatic system very much, and it won't shut you down. If if you're if it's real Anavar and it's just a DHT, you can run that for probably eight weeks without altering natural production. In my yeah, opinion. I don't. I don't remember the study, but I, I remember seeing a study one time that showed that uh, 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 I think up to 20 milligrams of Anavar in eight weeks, like almost has zero shutdown. It's it's very minimal. There's I can I can send you so many studies. There's one study that followed kids, uh, premature um, growth kids. They weren't growing in height. They gave them Anavar for two years straight, and they still were producing hormones effectively and had no hepatic. Uh, Dis dysregulation because of it so it's a pretty good one to run extremely that's the thing though is you have to do low dose uh long exposure so yeah anavar anavar is an interesting oral it, it it um sometimes i'll use it as a training wheel cycle like if i get somebody who just wants to dip their toes in the pool um i, I will start them off with anavar it's it's, yeah. a, it's a good good way to just you know see see how you feel see what you think of it you don't have to use a needle um, I, I, I remember, uh, I think it was Dr. Mike Israel tell had a thing up recently about that. People were asking me about it. I did a video on it, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good option for somebody just testing the waters out. Yeah. We got, we got one more question and we'll get off. I'll, I'll let it take so much of your time. Um, gentleman asks, is EQ or NPP better as a mean anabolic? Well, it depends on how you respond. Um, I found with people that I train, it's usually one or the other. Uh, the issue that people run into with, I think NPP, in my opinion, um, well, in, let, let's let's back up for a second. So NPP or DECA, I get I get a lot of people, you know, which should I use? I would always start with NPP. 
Um, the faster Esther in case you get into trouble so you can get off of it quickly. That's why we want to use MPPE fast in, fast out. Uh, I mean, I don't, you know, DECA, you're probably looking at two months for it to clear your system. Yeah. Um, so, so if you get in a situation where you get really bad anxiety or impotence or something like that, you might be stuck with it for a while. Uh, but the issue that I see that people run into with, uh, I think mandolone, in my opinion, um, at least for me, has been the mo more, most powerful antibiotic for muscle growth. Um, you know, you know I mean, when you look at it, in, you know, the, when you look at the research on it, really, they all have similar rates of muscle protein synthesis. But I, I just have seen um, nandrolone seems to be a, a very potent for putting on size. But the issue that people run into with nandrolone a lot of times is anxiety. Yeah. Like I said, impotence. Um, I, and if you are prone to gyno and you run nandrolone with testosterone, you are going to be in trouble. Yeah. I, I found it's just an instant case of gyno. And, and Nandrolone, from what I recall, upregulates aromatase expression. Mm -hmm. So that could be an issue if you're a heavy aromatizer. So usually, like guys that are skinny fat, um, I will, uh, you know, if you're, if you're um, uh, 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 endomorph, I will usually stay away from, <laughs> from Nandrolone. I found that it, it, it just causes more problems than it helps with, with uh, but ectomorphs tend to do really well with with nandrolone. It's just it's just what I've seen. Um, it, you know, I'm generalizing here, and equipoise does better for guys. Equipoise or primobolin would be a better choice for somebody who tends to be uh, uh, accumulate fat more easily and tends to be a heavy aromatizer. Usually, the heavy aromatizers are the people that tend to get fat easily. Yeah. Yeah, and and with that, like the NPP, you know, it's a progestogenic compound, so you're gonna have to now worry about prolactin, yeah. and where EQ is just a t another testosterone derivative. So, if you're someone you know who's prone to mental you know side effects and yeah. stuff, it'd just probably be better to do EQ. You know what's funny with the prolactin is like people get terrified of prolactin, and I look at hundreds of blood panels, and I have only seen one this year with high prolactin. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and I think I think people are mistaking the progestinic effects of it for prolactin. So I don't think it's actually uh, I don't think it's actually prolactin that's causing the problem with most people. It's actually the 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 how um, the progestinic effects of of nandrolone because it is a synthetic progestin. Mm -hmm. That's just me speculating. You think, you think that it's the actual nandrolone itself initiating like the potential? Yes. Gyno, yeah, yeah. I think I think it somehow binds with the estrogen receptor in in some way that we don't know about. For sure, I can definitely see that. All right, Paul. Well, I will let you go, man. Are you going to the Olympia by chance? No, I'm not going to the Olympia. I think I might go to the Arnold Classic. Okay. I was gonna say we could take the Olympia, but my house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's convenient. I'm such a homebody, man. I, I, I never leave my house. <laughs> I dig it, man. I'm the same way. Like. I'm I'm going to the Olympia and I literally have anxiety about it because I'm like, man, I haven't left the house in months. I I know I'm an introvert, man. I, I I go to the gym, I go to the grocery store, I cook food, I work out, I stay at home. <laughs> That's yeah. all I do. The life. All right, brother. Well, we will see you later. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna post this video up on YouTube too. I'm gonna splice it and get it up on YouTube, so I'll share that with you as awesome. well, so you can get that up there. Cool, cool. Awesome, my man. We need to get you on sometime too. I, yeah, I would I, love that. I, 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 I need, I need to do that. But just hit me up, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you on sometime. For sure. I'll send you those papers too. All right. Thank you. Cool. We'll see ya. All right. Take care.